Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Mysterious Galaxy virtual event. I am Nick, the director of events for Mysterious Galaxy. I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell any of you who I'm here with today, but I'm gonna because that's part of my job. Tonight, or today, depending where you're at, it's 3 a.m. for Adam. I just realized that, so I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but we are here to, today with Adam Christopher and Kristen Baver. Hello, you two. Hello. Hey, Thank you so much for having us. Um, but for those who are tuning in, like, who are these people? Well, I got some news for you. Adam is a novelist and comic writer. His debut novel, Empire State, was Sci-Fi Now's Book of the Year and Financial Times Book of the Year for 2012. But I first discovered him from his Ray Electromatic series, Robot Noir, featuring world's only robot assassin to detective. Loved it. And he's a great author. And joining in conversation is Kristen Baver, the associate editor of news for StarWars.com and host of This Week in Star Wars. <laughs> she also is the author of DK's Star, uh, Skywalker, A Family at War, and the forthcoming Abrams, The Art of Star Wars, The High Republic. Um, so thank you both for being here and thank you everyone who's tuning in. You, you're all are stellar. You're all commenting wonderful. Questions are already in there. You're blowing my mind. Um, of course, today we're here for Adam's latest book, The Shadow of the Sith. Look at that. So gorgeous. If it is. <laughs> if any of you haven't yet purchased your copy, don't worry, you can still do that. If you click the link below, it'll take you to our website, where not only will you see a list of Adam's books, including Shadow of the Sith, but you also see a list of Kristen's books, both forthcoming and ones she has already published. Um, and anyone who purchases a book by Adam Christopher will get a signed book plate from him himself. Well, it'll be coming from us, but he signed them, I swear. We didn't forge it. <laughs> um, and... Uh, again, everyone, thank you so much who has purchased books because your support helps us keep doing wonderful events with wonderful authors like this. Um, I have gabbed enough, so I'm going to disappear for now, but I'll see you all later in the program. I'm going to leave it to Adam and Kristen to go ahead and take it away. I'll see you later. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's joining today. We can't see you, but we can see the number. At, oh, it's at order 66. That's not good. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping there's like... One more person to come in. You know, or is that perfect? <laughs> is that perfect for Shadow of the Sith? Actually, yeah. You decide. I yeah, think it's kind yeah. of perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope it stays exactly there then. <laughs> oh, but it's so wonderful to see you again, Adam. So oh, we just got to so connect much. at uh, Star Wars Celebration a couple of weeks ago, a month and a half ago. Time is a, a flash. Ago, yeah. It's crazy. It is crazy. It's crazy. It's but. I'm so elated to be here celebrating the launch of your new book today. Uh, such an achievement. I've had a chance to read it. We're not going to spoil things. I know, obviously, Adam, you've read it, reread it, read it again, written it, rewritten it, probably read it again. Uh, but for the audiobook too. I've the audiobook. <laughs> I've, done, awesome. I've done the whole, the whole thing. You've done the whole thing. Um, so we'll try and keep it light, spoiler free, but. Uh, such a, a great book for someone who is a big fan of the sequel trilogy for you know all of Star Wars. Uh, it really does so much to add some connective tissue and really expand some of those characters who we've met in the sequels. And so just bravo. But enough gushing from me. Uh, let's talk about Star Wars. Let's talk about the book. Uh, Adam, to kick us off, can you talk about what made you a Star Wars fan? You know, how you first discovered the saga, why you think it resonated with you when you discovered it? So I'm sort of the classic um, child of the 80s. I'm like exactly the right age where things like Star Wars and I mean, the whole the works like Transformers, G.I. Joe, Masters of the Universe, um, all that kind of great stuff that I still love today. Like I haven't actually changed at all. Um, so my dad was into science fiction and, and he used to go on business trips to sort of Japan and uh, China. I'm from New Zealand and he'd come back with toys that you couldn't get in New Zealand. I mean, Star Wars was a big thing, but like I remember, you know, the Kenner X-Wing um, and the 8080 and all these figures and things and um, he also used to, he worked in advertising and he used to bring home at the weekend um, a VHS machine from his work 
and sort of on the way home on the Friday night, go to the local video store, pick up Empire Strikes Back, because that was my favorite movie, and then we would watch it. And I, you know, over a weekend, I'd kind of watch it six or seven times. And this is what I did. I, I don't know, five years, six years. I'm sure my parents were desperate for me to do something else or take some other kind of interest, but um, that was not to be. So it was, and, and I understand that's a completely privileged 80s Star Wars childhood. Um, this kind of, they allowed me to indulge this uh, obsession and this love of Star Wars. It sounds and quite think, ideal, and it's obviously, it's paid off now. All of that study of Empire has paid <laughs> off. I am. Look, here we are. Yeah. Yes. Um, you were just preparing was, for this future book book deal. Exactly. You were preparing. It's all the groundwork, yeah. But I think it, um, yeah, because Star Wars, especially that period, is really defined by things like the toys, you know. I mean, that's the whole phenomenon. So it was playing with action figures that kind of got me creating stories. So really, Star Wars has this um, kind of foundational level for me, I think, in terms of, of creativity. The other thing that I was really into was Doctor Who, because in New Zealand television was 10 years behind. So in the 80s, we were watching, you know, 70s Doctor Who. But Doctor Who has a big um, kind of legacy of written, of like books and literature. So I wanted, so I was, I was wanting to write my own Doctor Who books, and I was wanting to to write my Star Wars stories thanks to the toys. So I think the two kind of came together, and here we are, forty something years later. Um, here we are. You did so, it. You wrote a Star so like, Wars. Yeah, that's it. I made it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, and it it perfectly dovetails into something I wanted to make sure we talked about because, uh, you know, of course, Shadow of the Sith deals with some characters and from original trilogy it deals with some uh foreshadowing of events that we see take place in the sequel trilogy and you know, to your point that for a lot of kids part of the magic of star wars was playing with those toys and telling our own stories with those figures and allowing our brains to expand beyond the empire strikes back that we've just seen seven times maybe that day. Right. Uh, so I would love to hear where the kind of the kernel of the idea, the inspiration came from to write this particular story. And, you know, I'm curious if it started when you were watching the rise of Skywalker, when we see some of these characters for the first time, or if it was something that you had been wanting to write for much longer and, you know, maybe even 40 years back when you were playing with your <laughs> Luke and Lando action figures. Yeah, so two things sort of happened. Um, I remember watching the rise of Skywalker in the in the cinema on release, and firstly was like instantly struck by Lando's line to Ray when he talks about this journey that he and Luke took to find a wayfinder and to to chase Ochi Bestoon, because I immediately thought, well, that's a really odd combo of characters, like Luke and Lando. They're, they're friends, but they're not best friends. And, you know, we do see them, especially in the old days, they kind of had more interaction in the, you know, EU books. There's some in the modern comics, there's a little bit more. But really there was like a, it was a strange pairing. So that was my thought when I saw that scene. And then the second thing that was like a lightning bolt was the flashbacks we get of Ray's parents for like five seconds. And, and Ray's, mother was played by Jodie Comer. Now Jodie Comer is one of my favorite actresses. She's in a show called Killing Eve, which I love. And so good. I, well, I spend my entire time on Twitter trolling people with Killing Eve gifts because there's a there's a reaction gift for everything. Um, uh, like it's amazing. Yeah. So those are the two things that kind of struck me. And that's what I went away from. I mean, I saw like any good Star Wars fan, I saw the movie probably five times on release. Um, and then again, when it was available, you know, because you just what you do with Star Wars fans. Um, right. We should actually put out like a little like punch card for it where it's like, I've seen oh, this movie and then you could punch yeah. through it. Uh, yeah. Some people would need multiple cards, I know. But <laughs> yeah, it's um, like once is not enough and you miss so much the first time because oh, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. densely layered and there's, 
you know, all kinds of things happening in the background, the background aliens that become someone's favorite character ever, but like literally pass through a scene and you have to really scope them out. Yeah. And I think that's like, that's why Empire Strikes Back was my favorite movie growing up because it's, you know, I mean, the classic bounty hunter scene is the best example um, where there's these amazing characters who you see for five seconds and then they're gone. But you've got the action figures and they look really cool. And in fact, going back to what I was saying before, those were the action figures I played with because um, we didn't have any of their backstory on screen or anything, really. You know, Boba Fett gets a bit more. So I was able to create those stories myself because we didn't get them. So to me, they were the most interesting sort of characters. And again, mm. things like Rise of Skywalker is, is, carries on that tradition. I mean, even, you know, Dathan and Miramir, um, Ray's parents, they're in it for two scenes or three three flashbacks and there's like two lines of dialogue. Um, but with that, they've created this kind of whole world that I wanted to explore. Um, but yeah, when I, it came to actually writing the book, it's like, well, I just kind of, you know, got the email, uh, you know. The magic the email. Book. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't think I've asked. I like how calm you are in this retelling. You're like, yeah, I guess so. That sounds like yeah, so, fun. Yeah, oh, well, if you want me to. Yeah, okay. Um, right, if you but, insist. Yeah, but going back to your question, it's like, that was it. That was the brief. The brief was really, was right to that story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Lando tells Ray about their adventure. That's it. Go away and write the book. So easy, like, easy yeah, peasy. Easy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is that story? But yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned Dathan and Miramir before, and I want to get back to them because, uh, you know, Ray's parents, you know, as you were saying, they're in the film for, they're in Rise of Skywalker for precious seconds. Uh, Jodie Comer is amazing in those seconds. Uh, she has amazing reactions in those seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, you know, we don't even get, we don't get a name uh, for either of them. We don't, we don't get very much, uh, you know, on screen, which, is an amazing fertile playground for you to be in then as the author of this story. So tell us about not only, you know, naming Ray's parents, but fleshing out those characters. Did you reverse engineer them at all? You know, taking what we know of Ray and her abilities, uh, as, you know, as a scavenger, as someone who's able to really, you know, make something out of nothing uh, and just has so much, uh, ability to survive in in such horrible circumstances you know did you take that and kind of reverse engineer that into well, who are her parents that would create have such a child um you know or were you inspired by other things yeah no that's a good point um definitely there are aspects of ray that are in uh her mother mostly uh and that was definitely deliberate because you know ray I mean, she's a very capable character, even from a young age, I think we get hints of that in The Force Awakens. I mean, she survived on Jakku as a scavenger on her own. And I kind of, it's a, it's a combination of kind of natural abilities and kind of her learning to survive. And I think some of that had to come from her parents. So Miramir in particular, I mean, she calls herself a kind of tinkerer and she's very good with, with technology. Um, it's not a spoiler, but, you know, she she builds droids um in this kind of in a kind of fantasy twilight forest she builds droids um because again i also wanted a sort of slightly fantastical slash mystical element unrelated to the force but something magical about her her mother because um, mm. it's also in contrast to dathan because dathan obviously came from mexico uh he's a sort of failed strand cast and he has this nightmare childhood because Exegol yeah. is not a kind of planet you want to live on because it's horrible. Um, so it was really important to explore how he survived growing up because how, how could you on a planet like that? Um, so the contrast between him and Miramir's kind of backgrounds were important. But yeah, it was great to kind of be able to create these characters because they're a sort of strange pair in that they did exist because we have them on screen and we have dialogue and we know what they look like, but that was it. So even though they kind of, they existed, I still had to create them, which is a sort of interesting in between, you know, you've got Luke and Lando, who everybody knows and loves and have been 
going for 40 years. The book has also got completely new characters, which I've created, but these pair, this pair was sort of in the middle, which is, yeah, and it was really cool. So I was also aware that I was creating um, like kind of an important pair of characters, you know, it's Ray's mother and father. So there's a bit of responsibility to kind of make it interesting. Um, but yeah, and I love them. You know, I think it's their story is a real tragedy because this thing and the you know we know what happens to them, um, at, you know, at the end of their journey, but they don't know what happens. And it's really important that it sounds strange, but like they don't know that. Mm -hmm. So it's important when you when I was writing it to kind of put that across. So they've got you know plans and schemes, and they you know to kind of extricate themselves from the situation uh, and protect their daughter and they don't mm -hmm. know what's happening and mm -hmm. I, to avoid that kind of inevitability of their journey um, it was important that it kind of had some surprises and and I think when the end comes which it does come it's kind of out of the blue for them for them and for the reader uh, even mm -hmm. though we kind of have more knowledge Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, what a great pair. Yeah, well, and I think something else that you do quite well in the the story with with Dathan and Miramir, I keep wanting to call them the Skywalker family uh, because of Ray Skywalker, but I know that's not right. <laughs> um, but you, there's something you, that you do with Dathan and Miramir, and you do with you know some other characters, and something I think is such a staple of Star Wars storytelling is you know there's a tremendous weight, there's a heaviness to what's going on, and we know what's happening to this family, and we know that it is a tragedy but mixed into that there's bright spots of hope and there's humor um you know i love all of the the writing that you do with with ray and her multicolored blanket you know this this symbol of uh you know beauty that comes from her grandmother on her mother's side uh because you know and again just one of those interesting things that you play around with in the story where we have uh, that idea of a really good grandparent and then palpatine <laughs> yeah on the other side you know um but i think it's so important that when you have a story that you know is going to have a lot of that weight to it that you do have those moments of, of humor so it doesn't just feel so heavy but another interesting thing that you've done here is you, we learn more about lando's daughter uh how do you pronounce her name is it kadara kadara yeah Kadara, yes. Okay. Sometimes when I read something, I don't know how it's pronounced, and I pronounce it wrong for years. Uh, so I like to ask first. But you, you learn about Kadara, and it's it's precious little because you know they're not the focus. We know she loves ice cream. We know she's got great taste in capes. But why was it important to you to explore, uh, you know, not just Dathan and Miramir and their little family, but the ideas of parenthood and family and loss, you know, in this story beyond the scope of that little family on the run. Yeah, it sort of came out as a theme of the book that really everybody has lost something. Um, mm -hmm. Even the villains have lost something, and they and this and everybody is searching for something, whether they are actively searching, like you know, Ochi or Luke and Lando, or they're looking for something that that like whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, like Kaiser um, and her kind of the mask that controls her mm. um yeah star wars is all about, i mean it's star wars star wars is all about hope and redemption and um sort of themes like that um and family you know star wars is a big family story um mm -hmm. so i kind of it kind of organically all came together to kind of follow these themes like it was important for Lando we know that uh, his daughter's been kidnapped six years before the book and we know that's obviously affected him quite deeply but I also wanted to kind of show what it was like so it's it was important to have Kadara appear at some point mm -hmm. um, even if it's just a brief sort of you know flashback sort of thing because we you, know, you can't just tell we can't just tell you what's happened we have to kind of show what's happened even in a in a way, just a, a small glimpse, um, which really helps kind of underline his his tragedy, you know, because uh, his his life has been turned upside down. 
So it's just, yeah, this, this idea of loss, loss and hope, kind of opposites, I guess. Um, and searching for the right thing and searching for the wrong thing. Mm. But again, it's, it was not, I'll say this, it's, it's not uh, a sort of conscious thing when I was planning the book. It just kind of fell together organically because clearly this is what the journey that each of these characters was going on. So you've got Luke and Lando, you've got Dathan and Miramir kind of on that side, you've got Kaiser, you've got Ochi. Um, everyone's looking for something. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the way you've you've treated it with those flashbacks and with giving us some more information about, you know, Lando and losing his daughter and the search for his daughter and, you know, how much this is kind of drudging up those feelings for him now, you know, as they're trying to protect another child, uh, you know, really deepened the character for me and really kind of shifted the way I, I saw Lando, you know, in a really yeah. elegant and I think important way. Um, but you mentioned Ochi, and I want to talk a little bit about Ochi too, because Ochi of Bestoon, who just will not stop telling you his full title slash where he's from slash, you know, Pride doesn't know, and I don't know either, but I just, I love that he incorporates this into, you know, every conversation he has. Uh, but you, know, who is Ochi of Bestoon to you? And what do you think makes him so terrifying as an antagonist and as a villain here? He's a really interesting character because, again, he's one of these things from the Rise of Skywalker where we get the briefest glimpse of him. And, in fact, we only see his kind of face. Um, there's more of him in the behind-the-scenes documentary than there is in the movie where we kind of see the full, you know, height thing. Um, apparently, he was actually a puppet rather than an act, rather than a person mm. um, in a costume. So, he was, again, he was a blank slate. Having said that, he's sort of one of the main characters of um, the Darth Vader comic recently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, by Greg Park, um, where his character is really surprising. I mean, if we think of the Rise of Skywalker, where he's this kind of very cold assassin in black. I mean, he doesn't speak or anything, but like he's we we get the sense that he's a you know he's not someone you'd want to meet. Um, but in the in the not comic, someone you want to go for a drink with, even though he loves to have uh, a drink. He likes to have a drink. He talks about himself in the third person when he drinks as well, which is really annoying. Um, Tells you everything you need to know about this person though, yeah. right there. <laughs> so he's really established as a character in the Vader comic where he's actually kind of a bit of an idiot in a way. Um well, not an idiot, but like um annoying, you know. Um this very strange character. So the, the idea of where he, he went from the Vader comic, which is set between... Do you imagine his way a lot of times, too? Sorry. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh, no, it's okay. We, we have that classic, the internet allows us to speak all at once or not, no one's speaking. Uh, no, he's, he's very much a character that's in his own way a lot of the time, that he's, whether it's his own, what he's searching for or just you know, his own flaws, uh, he really gets in his own way a lot of the time. For oh, Ochi. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the thing, like, yeah, he's his own worst enemy. Uh, he's got this obsession which drives him to kind of find Exegol. But really, yeah, he's kind of a bit of a mess. Um, but it was important, you know, he gets the Sith blade in the book, he gets given it, <clears throat> and that really kind of had to change his character because he had to go from the kind of um, disaster from the comics to this really quite horrible, evil character. Again, using flashbacks, he's a Jedi. According to Lando, he was a Jedi hunter in the Clone Wars. So I wanted to show that as well um, in a kind mm -hmm. of fun flashback. But he's definitely... He's, like, I, I, I like him. I like him, but like he's he yeah. I don't know why because he's such a. Um, I keep using the word idiot, but he's not an idiot. He's he's, but he's sort of stupid in a way. Right, and right. He's, not, he's, he's very one track minded, and yeah, you know, I think that kind of creates its own level of idiocy in a in a character where you know they just they can't possibly see the forest for the trees, and they're just like so. Right. Uh, 
so boneheaded kind of at times but at the same time like he is villainous and he is scary and the way you describe you know the way his flesh is stretched across his face you know kind of in the sneer uh you know i was quite creeped out by uh plus i think i just really like droids and so knowing how poorly he treated dio and seeing that play out in your book as well i'm just like immediately <laughs> team like let's hunt down ochi <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell the, the character of a person by the way they treat things like droids. Um, yes. So yes. yeah, he yeah. Oh he's, yeah. He's See. Nasty. Yeah, and we've seen that you know throughout Star Wars for sure uh, with other characters too. That it you know the droids are like the dog, and if somebody's kicking the dog, you're immediately like this person's evil. They're no good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure. Yeah. Uh, in some of those flashbacks, as well as in some other scenes, you also got to incorporate uh, some characters in some places, uh, you know, and so just some nods to to past Star Wars storytelling that I really didn't expect, you know. And again, very light spoilers, but, uh, you know, the fact that Mace Windu shows up for a hot second and I was not expecting him to be here at all. Uh, I know we had an earlier excerpt from the book. I think the first excerpt from the book that came out um, you know, ended with the appearance of Anakin Skywalker as a force spirit. And I was so mad that the excerpt ended there. And I was like, now we must wait, uh, which I know is kind of, that's kind of the point. It's making me angry. So I want the book more and, and pick it up as soon as humanly possible. Uh, but do you want to talk about any of those, you know, Easter eggs or there any that are, uh, in Star Wars and I think I might have lost that where you know, at the outset you thought you know this is Star Wars I have to include these uh oh did you lose me mm -hmm. oh you're back okay all right wonderful <laughs> um so well, we're talking about, sorry about yeah, that we're talking about Easter eggs internet and yeah yes Yes. Yes. So Easter eggs in terms of, uh, you know, both some of the, those references that I think were a little lighter, like, you know, when Luke dropped into the, the waiting ship in your book, I immediately saw, you know, of course, Luke and Empire Strikes Back dropping into the, the Falcon. So you know, was it yeah. a conscious decision for you to incorporate all of those threads and references or you, at times were you finding that you were writing it and it just kind of organically, uh, you know, happened because Star Wars stories are so interconnected? It was sort of a bit of both. Um, I had some ideas of things right from the start that I wanted to just put in because I thought it would be cool. You know, I'm a Star Wars fan and what would I want to see as a kind of cool little, little bits and pieces? I mean, you, could, you know, Easter eggs in that they're not particularly plot relevant or important, but they're just, you know, this is what Star Wars is about. It's like little cool moments. And then some came um, organically as I was writing it. Um, the the Mace Windu scene, I think, was one of uh, the, the first ones that I kind of came to mind because I wanted to show Ochi in his prime as a Jedi hunter. So what better Jedi could he be hunting than um, the one that would definitely kill him if, if they ever met? So this kind of dream <laughs> where he's hunting, uh, well, he's not actually hunting Mace, he's hunting... Um, Whatever name is, I can't remember. His his part of one. Um, uh, Depa. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of also fun because like it really doesn't mean much, except it's like oh my goodness, it's it's Space Windy. Um, you know, Anakin Skywalker. In fact, the Anakin appearance was one of the first ideas that I had. Um, I kind of whenever I come up with a new story, I kind of maybe get flashes of scenes disconnected from anything but i think oh that should that should work so luke meeting um anakin on exegol was like well that well let's try and put that in um i also had the scene where ochi gets the blade given to him mm -hmm. and as the way the way that he's uh you know given his instructions by this mysterious voice from from somewhere mysterious in a mysterious way, uh, and in, in a scary way as well. Um, 
and but yeah it's like i'm a fan so i like to kind of put stuff in it's also important when i write tie-in books you know i've done stranger things and elementary and other things it's like okay you can put the stuff in as a fan and it's like really cool and little easter eggs but it's also super important that they don't overwhelm the book and you know anybody can anybody who's a star wars fan should be able to pick up the book you know if you walk into a bookstore and there's a star wars book and it's got luke skywalker in the front and you think i like star wars i'll give it a go you need to be able to pick it up and read it and enjoy it and everything you need is in the book if the stuff you recognize great and you'll get more out of it sure but it doesn't matter if you miss it, it doesn't matter you know i've got references that go back to the 1978 los angeles times newspaper strips nobody's going to talk about that stuff i know it's there and it's kind of fun but it's like yeah. it doesn't um, I feel like you and I'm, Pablo Hidalgo are like really excited by those references and like right. one other person was like I get it I think that I get that <laughs> well and yeah it's like I remember doing the kind of behind the scenes stuff but when I was doing the edit yeah you know, there's notes and comments and I would kind of be pasting in um a screenshot of a comic page or a panel or like the box of a toy from the 1980s which makes an appearance because it's like are we sure we're describing this correctly and i'm like yes if you look at this photograph of the merchandise it looks exactly like this um which is fun because this is this is then just a bunch of star wars people um you know geeking out over okay. obscure references um but yeah so it, it's kind of it's good to do that absolutely yeah Uh, I I love I could talk to you all day about the obscure references I think and just what you've what you did in this story. Um, I do want to make sure we have some time to to take some questions from the fine folks who are watching. Um, so kind of one last question that I had. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the characters and uh, you know both the the new characters as well as uh, you know some of those legacy char characters and enriching them. But there's also a lot of really cool places in Star Wars in general, but also in this book. Um, you know, you, we've got Nightside Station, which, you know, seems to be quite different than any other place that we've visited before in the galaxy. And I'm going to pronounce it Pilar. You'll tell me if it's wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Excellent. All right. Which is just such a strange new world, a uh, strange planet, both in the physical appearance and the properties it has, uh, you know, for, for a Comet's exile. So among those new characters and places that you created for the story, do you have a personal favorite and can you walk us through a little bit of you know, what inspired that creation for you? Um, Polar is quite cool. Uh, yeah. Um, so this is a planet where a character has sort of exiled themselves um, to kind of disconnect themselves from the galaxy to sort of atone for their past misdeeds. Um, and it's, again, it's this kind of visual thing. I had a lot of, because I was writing what I thought was sort of episode 6.5 because it's set between Return of the Jedi and Force Awakens and um, because I had this kind of scope in this big empty period essentially not quite but almost that I could kind of do do whatever I wanted to do so I thought okay this is episode 6.5 this is really um, like big and epic and cinematic and visual so I had a lot of sort of you know, Star Wars is a very visual mythology. So something like Polar, which is this planet, it's very, it's kind of white and it's it's like, it, it seems to be frozen, except not really. Um, it's white prairies and grasslands and it has this weird sort of radiation contamination. So um, I really just sort of, oh, you're back, you're back. Oh, yeah. I'm going to watch the recording to get that full answer because I couldn't tell if I was lost. But, um, yeah, Polar. Polar is a favorite. That's the answer. Awesome. That's the answer. All right. Wonderful. I'm going to take us to some, uh, I, Right. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. The internet gods hate me. I'm probably fr continually frozen making the weirdest faces. So 
I, I'm sure you'll all forgive that. Um, so let's get to some questions from everybody who's gathered here today. Uh, this first one comes from, and I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name, Gabriel Flores. Uh, Adam, what were some of your favorite Star Wars books when you were growing up and who were your influences? Uh, right. So because I'm that kind of age, you know, slightly older than, you know, uh, Star Wars books, there were some in the 80s. There's the Han Solo trilogy, there's the Lando Carizian trilogy. Uh, I had Splinter of a Mind's Eye. I think that's my dad's book. And I read it when I was quite young, not really following what was going on and, and wondering why it was sort of different to Star Wars because it's a sort of strange little story. Um, but certainly later on, um, I love Michael Stackpole's books. Um, yeah, his X-Wing series, I think is probably my favorite Star Wars books. Um, and I kind of, I pay tribute a little bit to, to Mike in the in Shadow. Uh, he makes a sort of strange little appearance. Um, which I hope people will, will work out. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> the greatest book of them all is the Revenge, Revenge of the Sith novelization by Matthew Snyder. Yes. Which is just can't be beaten. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, yeah. Shadow, Shadow even opens from it with a little kind of quote from that because it yes. really, it just, fit, it just really seemed to fit the, the themes and the imagery that I was going for. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I was kind of definitely Splinter. Sounds weird when I say it now. Actually, thinking about it, Splinter of the Mind's Eye was the book I read kind of twenty times because that was all there was. I mean, really, that was all there was growing up. Star Wars, yeah. apart from movie picture books, I had the Revenge, uh, Return of the Jedi, like photo picture book, and it had an audio cassette that was like the edited soundtrack, so you could kind of listen along. Um, but yeah, and then certainly when the EU came along, it's like. Yeah, so Michael Stackpole um, yeah. is a favorite. But, Splinter yeah. of the Mind's Eye is such a funny deep cut because uh, you know, as the first sequel novel, as the first you know, yeah. expanded universe sort of story, it's so confused when you read it now in the fabric of everything else because yeah, yeah. it was also you know, written with just A New Hope, uh, you know, which wasn't even called A New Hope yet, as its guiding light. So it's just very... It goes a very different direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, this one comes from Devin. It seems like the story is far-reaching ramification and fills in quite a lot of the information between the original and sequel trilogies. How much freedom were you given to weave the story versus getting specific direction from Lucasfilm Story Group? Um, basically, I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do, uh, which is great. So this is really the first opportunity to one of the first opportunities to directly link the original trilogy with the sequel trilogy. And again, as I was saying before, if I, I treated it as being episode 6.5. So this real bridge between the two. And really, I mean, honestly, the brief was go away and write that story that, that Lando mentions. And that was it, you know, because also I think nobody really knew what that, what that was. Um, and sure, there was, there was things that we get in the rise of skywalker kind of hints and uh kind of unfinished storylines sort of plot threads and things that were really good to kind of go and explore you know um, you know why did ray see ochi's ship take off from jakku was one of the big starting points it's like well clearly there's something happened where Ochi is on Jakku and like Ochi is finding Ray, but Ray's already there. So there's a lot of things to explore, um, you know, and what happened to Old Poseidon. And things. And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of fun and a lot of freedom, which is great. They could trust me enough to go and do the story and not worry about it, um, which is for a writer is kind of perfect um, to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, this one comes from Ben Solo. He's here. He's watching. What's the relationship between Ben and Luke? How do you <laughs> how do you see Ben's personality uh, before Ben turned to Ren? And in comparison to some of the other Jedi students of Luke's that we see uh, who saw the light and darkness in Ben, you know, was Ben unique compared to his peers, in your opinion? I think he was. Um, he appears briefly. Real long <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch that. 
Going oh, yes. To, yeah, going back to Ben. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I think he is because he's got, he's not only a student of Luke's, but he's a, he's a relative of Luke's. So there's this kind of clash between um, kind of family and tradition, which is something that Luke is dealing with as well, because Luke is trying to rebuild the Jedi Order. And he's really starting at this point in time to adhere to the kind of core tenets of, of the Jedi, which is in one way, it's a good thing because, like, he's trying to rebuild it. On the other, on the other side, it's possibly not the best thing for people like Ben. And I think we can see it a little bit. It's only in a, like a couple of chapters, but but Luke can sense something in Ben. He, he calls it like a slow anxiety, but or an edge to him, which like means Luke thinks he's going to become a great Jedi. Uh, but there's also a, a slight worry. Sort of, I mean, Luke, it's, it's like kind of pre, he's not, he's not worried yet, but he can see something in Ben that does make him different. Uh, and again, it's like, this is important stuff that yeah. we know what happens to Ben, and we know what happens to the temple, we know what happens to Luke. Uh, even though that is years away, it was important to kind of put in some little breadcrumbs of, of something. Um, but also fun to explore because you know Luke is rebuilding the Jedi Order. What does that look like? He's rebuilding it from nothing. He's the last Jedi. And in the book, we see others. There's students, and there's um, you know he's got that that temple that we see him building in the Book of Boba Fett is now fully operational. <laughs> you just you couldn't avoid saying it. I, I saw it in your eyes. You were like, yeah. I just I so have to I say fully operational yeah, here. Yeah. Don't yeah. resist it. Don't resist. <laughs> this one comes from Jim. After some of the original trilogy characters to the sequel trilogy, if you could write any other character or time in Star Wars, what would you want it to be? So is that... Could you repeat that? Sure. I thought you were just deep in thought. Uh, if you could write any other character or time in Star Wars, uh, what would you want it to be? So I'd really like to write <clears throat> um, a Vader story. But the problem is, we've just had Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney+, Plus, which is the most incredible characterization of Vader and the most evil, um, dark, powerful, version of him that we've seen i think personally so like how could you ever compete with that it's like set the standard so high um but who knows maybe one day um yeah there's others there's like i like little characters little characters and big characters i mean there's more characters in the sequel trilogy that i would like to write and, and expand into, into full stories um but at the same time, I loved. I found I loved writing people like Lando and Luke. So, um, you know, I'm I'm kind of got the taste for both of it. I think. <laughs> okay. This book connects to a lot of other canon material. This one comes from Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. How was your experience with the story group getting everything lined up? Yeah, that's interesting. I think, um, I mean, I'm a fan, right? And I read the books, I read the comics, I watch everything, animated, you name it. Um, you know, EU, canon, whatever. It's all Star Wars. So everything that was in the book that kind of connected things was from me because I thought it would be kind of cool. Like, you know, there's, there's everything from, from, as I said, those newspaper strips, but there's also High Republic. There's also prequel trilogy. There's like these connections and they were all, I think, organic in that either either they came to me as I was writing and they kind of they kind of fit the story, or I had planned them, but they kind of fit the themes and you know, everything is in there for a for a reason. It's not just kind of throwaway stuff. Um, and I think like I was saying before, when I was pasting in panels from the comic or like a box, a toy box, um, it was it was less about controlling what was in the story, but making sure that um, I kind of had got it right. 
and you know this is this is one star wars geek talking to another bunch of star wars geeks and it was mostly just fun <laughs> saying you know, how do you describe that toy or what is that comic panel yeah. reference um so i don't think i don't think there's any particular guidance um or suggestions or you know it was just kind of a fun experience to be able to, to talk about that kind of stuff in the middle of doing a story it's like you know yeah that's fun i was so excited when the targon showed up because yeah. as you were describing i was like is it is it i think it is and then it was um i have to ask though you keep mentioning this toy box what was this toy oh so it's the cap was... two cap two captivator which is a little okay. one man walker um the the it's like yeah like this is the series of toys from empire strikes back that are not in the movie they created right. them especially for the toy line like one one figure toys so they were kind of small and, and like inexpensive and the box has uh bosk as the pilot and delivering is it even luke you, you, you can find the box online and see what the picture is but like it has this kind of it's a two-legged thing and it has this this claw at the back uh capture claw um yeah the mini, mini rigs, rigs. Yeah, yes yeah. thank you Devin. Yeah. thank you and there's another one called an <laughs> int4 which i didn't use but i'm going to use that next time in something i'm going to canonize nice. all of the little toys that never were in the movie <laughs> Oh, I love it because it, it makes a whole generation of kids who had those toys and made stories with them and love them, you know, feel like vindication. Like here it is. Now it's in the story. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, this one comes from Matthew. How much did the Greg Pot comic influence your writing of Ochi and all the lore around Exegol? Yeah, well, super super important because this is where ochi was created really like i said we see him in the rise of skywalker but he was really created in the comic and uh again that comic really established exegol and what the emperor was doing on exegol like during the original trilogy and in fact if you if you kind of extrapolate the plan that he had and what he was doing it started right after revenge of the sith you know, he's been working on this Exegol plan and this fleet and essentially as a way to escape death because, you know, even in Revenge of the Sith, he's talking about Darth Plagueis and, you know, there are some things, I can't remember the quote, it's three in the morning, but, you know, the dark side leads to some things which are, some would call unnatural. Or whatever yes, it yes. It's okay. Yeah, we talking, all know the quote. We're all like auto filling it in our I'm head. It's about, okay. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing of the rebirth and, and survival after yeah. death. So he's been planning that for, uh, you know, 20, 30 years. Oh, yeah. Well, all Palpatine is, loves the long game. Uh, yeah, Palpatine's yeah. all about thing. that long game. Yeah. But I think once you realize, because in Rise of Skywalker, it's like, oh, there's Exegol, there's this huge fleet, and suddenly it seems very like, oh, that was there all the time. So um, going back to the comic, to link it to the book um, was really important because this is where we this is where we get all the lore of Exegol. And also Ochi, the character, this is where we see him. We, uh, we see him as, a, as an earlier version of himself because, you know, he changes, things happen to him. Um, and also that visit that Vader and Ochi make to Exegol, which is in the comic, is, is like from a certain point of view, there's like there's another side to that story of their visit that we see in Shadow, which is kind of important. Um, not to give any spoilers. Uh, listen to the audiobook though, um, when it comes to that scene, and then suddenly kind of this vague descriptions and then you hear Vader's breathing um, really kind of blew me away. Um, which is really cool. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, this question comes from Alicia. Do you have any advice or tips for someone who wants to become an author? Her dream is to write Luke Skywalker content. And it's the one thing that she's working towards, but she's not too sure where to start. I think this goes to the fact that if you want to write Star Wars, you have to just want to write. Um, there was a Doctor Who author, Terence Dix, who sadly passed away a few years ago, but like he wrote 
like most of the books for Doctor Who and he was a script editor on the show. And again, people wanted to write Doctor Who books and his advice was, if you want to write a Doctor Who book, the key is you don't want to write a Doctor Who book. You have to want to write. It's kind of this kind of yeah. strange circular logic. But the key for me was basically persistence. So I started writing. I mean, I've always been a writer, but like my first book came out 10 years ago now. And it was just, you got to keep going and keep writing and write what you're interested in and write what you love. And um, the default state of a writer is people are going to say no to you all the time. And that's fine. And you keep going. And you write something and no one yeah. likes it and it gets rejected a hundred times. And you're like, okay, let's do the next thing. You know, I wrote my first manuscript, like novel length manuscript, I think back in like 2006, because having done short stories and kind of my own things, I thought, can I even write a book? So I wrote a book and like it's a hundred thousand words of total trash, like just, <laughs> just rubbish. And that's fine because I thought, okay, I can write a hundred thousand words. So then I'll write the next one. And the next one was a bit better. And I was like, okay, put that aside, next one. And the next one was a bit better. And then the next one was a bit better. And it was only my kind of fourth, third or fourth manuscript. I thought actually this may be uh, good enough for somebody um, to, to kind of be interested in. So the key is like persistence. And persistence and persistence and persistence and you've got to keep going and people are going to try and stop you and kind of crush your dreams and say you can't do it and ask why are you doing it but you just keep going and then it's like here i am 10 years later i've written a star wars book um specifically with tie-ins they're very difficult to get into because you need that uh, kind of proven track record as an as a professional published writer. So like, you know, I, my first book came out 10 years ago. So they've kind of got 10 years worth of um, evidence that I can write a book because tie ins have deadlines and very tight deadlines, super tight deadlines. Um, so they really have to be able to trust that you know, kind of what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, that's my advice. Like, keep going, keep writing, just write. Right. That's great advice. Um, and I think it's so important because every writer who has you know, succeeded has had to persist through some things and, you know, has no writer starts out and is just immaculate. You know, no one, everyone has to kind of slog yeah. through that, that period where you're writing garbage and you know, it's garbage, but you just have to get it out and find your way back to your, know, find your way out of, of that particular you know, period uh, to get to a point where, you know, if you start to feel like it's pretty good, it's usually much better than that. Cause also I think, I don't know any writer, maybe I know one or two, uh, but it's very rare for a writer who doesn't suffer from incredible imposter syndrome and just this feeling like everything they're writing is terrible, even when it's other people are telling them it's good, you know, like it's winning awards, it's getting published, people are excited about it. And they're yeah, still like, is yeah, it bad yeah. though? It might be yeah. bad. I'm not sure. <laughs> we all feel that way. This is key and drowning out all of those people who say you can't do it or you're too go what adam's saying oh here comes nick though which means our time <laughs> must be that was a great entrance too it was just like you showed up boom <laughs> boom i'm sorry i'm sorry everyone's questions couldn't get answered but there was just so many wonderful questions that you know what that's just sometimes what happens but uh thank you so much everyone for submitting them Adam, thank you for being such a trooper with your monster energy drink off to the side and what is almost four o'clock over there now. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Big gulp there. <laughs> Kristen, thank you. Yes, Adam is a boss, let it be known. <laughs> You're a boss too, Kristen, because the internet gods have not been too kind to you <laughs> this event. So okay. thank you so much That's for okay. just keeping on, keeping on. <laughs> sure. Can I just point out before we go, 
if I'm right, Voodoo Val in the comments is the artist who did the Kaiser poster for the Barnes and Noble special edition. Um, so, which is which is awesome. Yes. Hello. Amazing. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah. Congrats. Awesome. Thank you again, everyone, for being here That's tonight. Awesome. And remember, if you haven't yet got your own copy, you can still do so. Shadow and Sip. Uh, we still have copies here in the store. Click the link below, take you to our website. We do ship uh, nationwide, including outside the United States, just saying. And we have still some signed book plates from Adam. And you can also pre-order uh, any of Kristen's upcoming books, as well as order any of the ones uh, that Kristen has already done. That's also on the same page. With that, I'm going to say good night to everyone. Bye, Adam. Bye, Kristen. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you all in the next event. Bye.